Joshua, the Patrick Griffiths, you know, the T.O. holders, you know, these folks, you know, the, 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 the sets and the Mahangars and these guys uh, who were multidimensional, they played great sport, they were bright, um, they were sweet boys, if, you know, sweet boyism is to be a, 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 a big thing. So I would say, you know, um, take that uh, over examining um, out, of, uh, out, of the, uh, out of the system. I must say that I am impressed with the students from the University of Gaia, those that I have met at Ohio University. I have never met a Guyanese student coming to Ohio University who has not accepted. I've never met a Guyanese student from UG coming to Ohio University who has not excelled. Mm -hmm. So within all of the contradictions and constraints and deficiencies that exist at UG right now, because I work very closely um, with the University of Guyana, there is something about the inherent uh, talent of the a Guyanese student at the University of Guyana and uh, a passion, I would say, um, by uh, by the, uh, some faculty members at the University of Guyana, particularly the younger generation that is coming on stream, uh, you know, taking on leadership roles at the University of Guyana. So um, if that's a complex question about education, I had one that gave me a lot of time for recreation, nature study, you know, school trips, um, schoolyard play. Um, after school activities um, from what I've been able to discern in Guyana um, that spare time, that free time, that time for um, building relationships, for socializing, for cultural transfer um, is not as, as, uh, as, as strong as it used to be. So let's, um, let's go back Dr. Cambridge if you don't mind to the whole cultural um, education you had and, and these various experiences, the Yoruba singers and, and the African 69. Um, I, am I pronouncing it correct? Is it African or Africa 69? Well, Africa. The, the, uh, African 69. Um, well, okay, Tribe 69. Sorry? Tribe 69. Oh, tribes, tribe 69. Sorry mm. about that. I apologize. Tribe 69. Um, This this question, I'm not sure how to phrase it, but um, I, I'm going to ask it. Ask you. I'm going to introduce it this way. The number of the year 1823. There, mm. there seems to be um, a lot of controversy about um, a monument uh, that is supposed to be erected. Um, in honor of the um, the slaves that were were executed or killed in 1823, um, what what are your views on that, Dr. Cambridge? I think 1823 is one of the most important moments in Guyanese history. Mm -hmm. um, I think it is a profound moment. It is a moment of misunderstanding of the strength of the um, African um, in Guyana. Um, it was a time of major misunderstanding between missionaries um, and planters about who that African was in Guyana. Just think about it. By 1823, you had um, almost um, 200 years of the enslavement of the African in Guyana. You've got native-born um, Creole Africans, and you still had um, Africans who were coming in as um, enslaved um, persons. Despite the fact that the slave trade was so-called so ended in 1808, you still had smuggling of Africans into to Guyana. And here in this coast of Guyana, from Georgetown, so, um, uh, you know, as far as uh, Maikoni, 
you've got over 10,000 enslaved um, um, Africans rising up to articulate and express their dignity. The consequences of that are profound. It has implications, you know, right across um, not only Guyana, but the Caribbean, the British West Indies, and the United Kingdom, and even into um, you know, the United States of America, where they are really um, ratcheting up their um, enslavement of Africa. I think the conversation on the commemoration uh, of that is inadequate. I think it is inadequate. Um, I don't think that a monument is enough to um, commemorate that. I think what is needed in Guyana is a new commemoration paradigm, a piece of public history, so the society could understand the geography, the geographic scope of that um, event. Think about it. When the enslaved African rose up on the East Coast, the troops that were sent out there by Murray are going to be blessed at St. Andrew's Kirk. That is a historic spot. And then they, trans they traverse up to the East Coast, success, dot four, you know, right all along up there. I think the commemoration of 1823 deserves a public history um, um, a, um, a public history commemoration model that links together all of that. A parent should be able, or a set of school children should be able to get on a bus or in a car and move from the St. Andrew's Kirk, you know, up the East Coast, see all these places, and back to the parade ground. So I think the current discourse about a single monument, if it is at 18, um, it's on the sea walls or in the parade ground is inadequate. It is totally inadequate. I think a much more comprehensive and complex public history strategy should be developed. And I would encourage all the parties, the, 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 the committee 1823 and the Ministry of Culture to get together and think through something more substantial, something multidimensional. Where is the educational piece about it? MCN should be challenged to get into this. Um, I think the current discourse is unidimensional and it needs to be much more comprehensive. The issue of it, where a statue is to be placed is, is partial. Um, you know, um, all of those places are sacred places and all should be marked with some commemorative uh, material. Um, that, this is my personal view. Right. You've asked me personally, and this is my personal view. As a matter of fact, you're the first person that has asked me um, that question. I think that there needs to be a much more comprehensive design approach to the commemoration of this pivotal moment in um, world history. Um, 1823 is not just a Guyana thing. It, it demonstrates the Guyan Guyanese um, strength. Um, it, it demonstrates Guyanese um, resolve. Uh, but it had uh, major um, international and global implications. 1823 should be one of these moments that is a teaching moment, a moment that allows our nation to learn. And I think public history, um, a, 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 you know, a, 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 a new paradigm in terms of commemoration needs to be developed. And unfortunately, I'm not seeing it in the conversation that is taking place, either in the Ministry of Culture or among the, 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 the committee uh, for um, 1823. I think they should go to the drawing, go back to the drawing board and come up with something that is comprehensive and multidimensional, emblematic of what? What transpired in 1823. Thank you for that, that answer, Dr. Cambridge. But I, I want to... You are breaking up, Selvin. So, uh, can, can you hear me now? Um, you're still cracking up. I'm cracking up. Hold on. Um, can you? Is is this much better? 
Much better. Much better. Okay, wonderful. Um, speaking of teaching moments, mm-hmm. I, I have I, I heard you and I, hear, I heard you clearly, and 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 uh, what you said was so comprehensive and makes a lot of sense. But I, I want to ask this question in the context of um, monuments and places. And especially for those of us who are students, or old and new students, for the young people in the diaspora, in and out of the diaspora that are listening tonight, what is the significance of having a monument to any people, but more, especially, more, more importantly, to the African peoples? What is the significance of a monument? What is the significance of a monument? Well, there are several dimensions to monuments. First of all, um, monuments are markers. Ma- monuments are things that are pay homage. Monuments are things that uh, you know enshrine and encapsulate uh, a, a historic moment or a personality or a big idea. And in some colonial um, territories, you know, there are trophies. You know, you go to London, you see the obelisk in uh, Trafalgar Square. That's a trophy of British imperialism. Right. Um, so m- monuments are, 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 are some of those things. Monuments are also celebrations of, of the artistic capabilities of a society. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So there are many dimensions to monuments. You know, a marker of a moment, a homage to a moment, um, tribute to a personality, um, you know, uh, an, a, a, a motivation um, for the future and also um, a tribute um, to um, a society's capacity to, do, to make monuments. And I think one of the things about um, Guyana is that, um, that, that um, Mr. Ivor Tom, who has um, gotten, um, I think, more than his fair share of licks, um, is, um, is, is, is demonstrating Guyana's capacity to make monuments. Because this is not the first monument that Tom um, is making is Damon Monument in, uh, in, in Essequibo um, to another national hero. Um, his work on uh, Forbes Burnham's um, mausoleum in, at the Seven Ponds is another um, body of work. And what is important is that Tom created the technology to do this thing in Guyana. Wow. Typically, you would have exported this thing and had it done overseas. So I think when you're looking at, 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 at monuments, it is the, the, the domestic capacity um, to do uh, monuments. And I had the good fortune to go to the back of the Burroughs School of Art sometime in, um, in October of last year, either June or October, one of the, the times I was in Guyana and saw Tom working on a makeshift foundry at the back of the Borough School of Art, thus creating at the Borough School of Art, outside of Cuba, the only space for monumental sculpture. You know, so, you know, as we, as we ventilate, and I think people need to ventilate mm-hmm. um, as we deal with this very um, sensitive topic of 1823. Right. We should also recognize that monuments is about te- technological capacity. And what Tom has demonstrated is that we can develop and sustain that capacity in Guyana. And what he's done by doing it at Borough School of Art, he's now left in place an infrastructure that other students uh, who, were, who are, would be interested in monumental um, sculpture um, can, um, you know, can, can use that technology. You know, one of the reasons why I ask about the, the um, importance of monuments. Um, You're breaking up again. Oh, um, okay. Can you hear me better now? Mm-hmm. Okay. One of the reasons why I asked about the importance of monuments is to lead into a, a particular question, uh, especially after you've so eloquently um, given us r- not only the reasons for the 1823 me- monument, but how it, it should really be, um, that period should be commemorated. Um, I want to ask you this. 
in, in terms of sensitivities and uh, sensibilities, do you understand the the reason for um, uh, well, I mean, having articulated the, the, the reason behind monuments, but why so many people are so sensitive and so many emotions are charged, and you mentioned ventilate, ventilate just now, so many people are ventilating about the erect, the positioning of this monument. Um, can, you, can you shed some light as to why you believe that um, this is happening right now? And why so many people are so um, vested in in seeing it erected where they think it should be on parade ground? No, no, there's no doubt that um, many of the people who we respect and recognize for their um, integrity, um, like Martin Carter and Tommy Payne. Um, you know, have identified and associated um, the parade ground um, as a space in which um, some of the most barbaric uh, forms of punishment uh, took place uh, during, a, you know, a, a, you know at the end of the 1823 uh, revolt. You know, Martin Carter's poem, you know, um, you know, when he, he says, you know, in the premises of the mouth, well, the anarchy of the ear, um, that poem in which he says, um, so jail me quick, clang the literate door, the freedom rings no happier alphabet. In that poem, he talks about the proud playing ground um, being um, the, 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 the burial site, being a, um, I can't give them the specifics of the poem, but Carter did bring into national consciousness this, that venue. Um, as a site um, for, um, you know, for um, for the brutality that was meted out um, to people who were agitating um, for their rights. So there's a lot of emotional um, association um, with that. Um, as I said, people who um, have national credibility have um, identified, um, you know, that space um, with that. Um, because, and I, I come back um, to my um, uh, contribution, um, because of the geography of this, um, the, um, that, that kind of vulgarity of cutting people, cutting off their heads and putting it on stakes on, uh, um, on the parade ground, it was not unique to the parade ground. Um, that methodology, that vulgar methodology, was um, applied right across um, the the um, east coast um, of, 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 of Demerara. So I'm saying that um, I could understand the sensitivity of the parade ground, but I think that uh, from the St. Andrew's Kirk right up the east coast, you know, as far as um, where those estates are, where those 10,000 uh, people um, um, who were mobilized in this, needs to be recognized as hallowed ground and recognized um, and, and recognized um, there with. You know, I'm reading, you know, um, about 10 years ago, my sister-in-law, um, Dr. Pat Smith, um, Dr. Claire Smith, um, gave me this book as a Christmas um, gift, uh -huh. right? Um, Crown of Tears, Crowns of Glory, Tears of Blood. The Demerara Slave Rebellion of 1823 by um, Emilia de Costa. And um, this morning when I was looking at the um, Facebook um, responses uh, to your posting announcing this, um, Maya Trotz did say to me, hey, this is going to be um, one of these questions we're going to want to ask you tonight about 1823. So um, to be forewarned uh, is to... Um, challenge one for preparation. So I went back to reading um, this. So I'm, you know, I, I'm really convinced um, with the proposition that we need to recognize all of these holy spaces um, for this. And I, my, my thought is that a much more comprehensive, multi-dimensional um, approach um, needs to be um, taken. Parade ground, absolutely important. Um, uh, 
a colleague of mine um, sent me um, so, uh, uh, some prints um, from a British magazine um, that was um, published um, a, a few months after 1823. And, you know, um, there the heads on the stake um, around, the, around the parade ground. Yes, indeed. So I could understand that. Um, no one is, um, you know, um, denying the significance of the parade ground. I come back to my point. The geographies of 1823 was profound and big. And I think we need as a nation to recognize and celebrate and commemorate that geography. Before From the I... church, uh -huh. where those troops were billeted, where they mar um, marched on and, and to the vulgarity on the East Coast, to the heroics on the East Coast, um, and to the parade ground. I think we need to, 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 to approach it in that kind of My thought, just... Um, I, um, just my... Be before I take a break, I want to ask you this question and then take, then take a break um, while you think about it. Uh, I, I read somewhere a few days ago um, one of the articles uh, that said the government had originally wanted to put it one place and then they they they, they asked questions and no one uh, responded no one in the cultural community no one in the opposition responded to them um, be that as it may the the, the, the question well you know, oftentimes that is usually the argument when things don't go, when things go wrong or there's some controversy, people said um, th that no one responded and so on. Uh, but th th there's another side to that, that sometimes people are not asked. And um, But I, I'm going to ask you this, Dr. Cambridge, if, if you were approached um, to offer your opinion and to make a contribution in that that manner, will you be willing to do that? Or has anyone ever approached you? That I guess that's a fair question. Has anyone ever? Nobody has ever. Nobody has ever approached me mm -hmm. um, about about this in that kind of uh, direct kind of way. And no one has. You know, no I, I, I'm hoping that um, because I, I've stated time and time again about the the, the third dimension to this show, the chat room. And I am inviting um, members of the audience to ask their questions. Um, uh, the questions about this 1823 uh, commemoration and so on. So uh, we'll take a short break and um, continue on the other side.
back with Dr. Cambridge. I'm Selwyn Collins, your host of CWS. Dr. Cambridge. Hi, Selwyn. Wonderful. Um, while we were on a break, uh, someone made some comments in the chat room. Well, uh, let me let me go back a little. There is a Mark Mark that says, Invasion of the bed, of the bedroom. Very funny. Delighted by your humbleness. Um, Barbara says, Good evening. Um, QDP says, Good night, guys. Thanks, Dr. Cambridge, for the historical piece of information and refreshing my memories with my primary school history in Mackenzie. I'm in total agreement. If, if you, on your take, your take on the multidimensional monument of the 1823 slave rebellion, immediately the Martin Luther King historical site where there is much more to learn and relate to than just a bust of him. That is what I'm visualizing for Guyana. Hence a big plot of land to erect that site. I think you should volunteer your, your input to the Guyana government. Um, any any comments on that? Did you say one of the comments was from Mark Matthews? No, no, no. Well, yes, I, I don't know if it's Mark Matthews, but it says Mark Mark M C K. Probably you know who that who that is. Okay, well, if, if it is Mark Matthews, you know that is one of my heroes. <laughs> um, you know, he was part of my cultural education here, South and Peter Kempadu, um, back in the seventies. So. If it is Mark, thank you, Mark. Um, and to everybody who made their comments, I, I truly appreciate um, those um, comments. Um, sure, sure. Um, whatever contribution I can make, I will make. Wonderful. Um, I think it's only fair that um, you should be asked you should be asked questions or should be asked for your input rather than for once to assume that you, you're asked and not and reluctant to offer your, your contribution. Um, I, I, we've spent some time on 1823 and I, I really want to examine some of your other facets. Um, being the president of the Guyana Cultural Association, I, I, it's based here in New York. Um, what is the importance of having such an association, Dr. Cambridge? Again, being a student, and for those young folks who are listening in, why is it so very important for us to have that? Well, you know, um, I can't remember the uh, specific statistic, but if you look at um, Global Guyana, this, by do, the term Global Guyana, I'm referring to Guyana and its diaspora. Mm -hmm. We're talking about, about 1.6 million um, people, about 700, um, thousand in Guyana and about 900,000 outside of Guyana. Of that 900,000 outside of Guyana, appro approximately 400,000 live in New York between Brooklyn and Queens. So New York is uh, a very significant aspect of, uh, of Guyana's uh, reality. Um, uh, so many of our culture keepers um, are in New York, um, people with the memory, uh, people with the competencies live in New York. So um, the Guyana Cultural Association, um, our roots um, go back to Guyana um, in the 1980s um, when at Guyana Broadcasting Corporation, um, our general manager, um, Terry Holder, um, uh, challenged um, us to um, do more to um, highlight, showcase, and celebrate Guyana's multi-dimensional folk heritage. Um, I had the good, uh, the good fortune to be in the program director for culture, and um, I had some wonderful colleagues there, Margaret Lawrence, Basil Bradshaw, Ave Brewster. Um, we all got together and we um, built on a tradition that Mark Matthews and Wordsworth McAndrew and Matthew Allen and Rex Pereira um, did when we had BGBS, when they would hold these um, Sunday festivals um, in the, um, the Durban Park. Um, so based on that kind of heritage, 
um, we pulled together um, the Guyana Folk Festival um, in, in Guyana, it, starting, I guess, 81 um, through to about, um, I migrated in 1986. Um, well, by the turn of the, um, you know, by the end of the 20th century, uh, 2000, um, there were so many of us who worked at GBC or in the uh, creative uh, community in Guyana, found ourselves um, in um, New York and its environment. And um, Claire Gorin, and um, his name slips me for a moment, um, I, I've come back, um, I, I'm seeing him, very dapper guy, um, worked in the film center, uh, Morris Bledman. And they said, hey, we're going to re resuscitate um, this activity of bringing together the Guyanese community, the culture keepers, to celebrate the folk heritage so that they can pass these experiences on to um, their um, children and their grandchildren. Uh, 2001, we got a very uh, energetic um, president, Malcolm Hall, and Malcolm and Claire and Morris Bledman and Claire Patterson and Juliette Emanuel um, got together to work on this idea and recognizing that ideas work best when there is some kind of organization uh, to support them, um, uh, this group uh, um, rehabilitated um, the um, Guyana Cultural Association. And the, the rest is history. It's now 11 years old. Um, our cultural um, vision is simple, um, to promote, to propagate, and to uh, preserve Guyana's multi-dimensional um, um, cultural history. It is about preserving. It is about documenting. It is about um, making accessible um, sharing is about encouraging and um, this is what um, we have been doing um, we have um, we published um, we organize moments of reflection um, we you know we do a lot of interesting things and i say keep you know, stay tuned um, gca is poised to do some very exciting things um, over the next um, three to five years well, I'm, I'm, I'm encouraged and I'm sure the listeners are looking forward to it. Um, uh, have you, how, how do you measure or have you seen much of an impact with, with, with um, all this, these activities? Have you? You know, um, and, and, and I would say this is now going beyond anecdotal impact. Right. You know, um, we have um, in the Guyana Cultural Association, Volunteers, and I use this word um, very, very, with, with great pride, volunteers uh, who are very proud of their contributions. And we have two volunteers from the national, who are members of the National Dance Company, um, Verna Walcott and Rose October. And one of the heavy things that happened after Carrie Festa 72 in Guyana was the serious study of Guyana's folk dance forms. And um, Lavinia Williams spent a lot of time with her students, um, which included Rose and Werner, studying um, the, the Kwe Kwe um, choreography, the, the Kwe Kwe repertoire. So um, as part of our folk festival season, it's come to our Kwe Kwe, that Friday night moment. Now, I think we have seen from that a couple of things. We've seen a dissertation. Um, G Dr. Gillian, um, Ka um, Gillian uh, Richards, um, who did her PhD at um, Indiana University, um, she started her research on the Kwe Kwe as it was being translated and uh, manifested in, in New York. So we began to see um, the activity supporting um, robust um, study. Um, the other thing was, um, was in Guyana, um, people started to look at the GCA's Kwe Kwe tapes, as the uh, Kwe Kwe DVDs, as the templates <coughs> for 
organizing Quekways in Guyana. It was um, interesting to note that um, um, Alan Fenty, in an article on the resurgence of Quekwe in urban Georgetown, drew attention to the um, role of the um, GCA DVDs uh, in this um, thing. So you're seeing that kind of uh, um, evidence. Um, there, um, there are other um, elements um, of the significance of um, Ghana uh, Folk Festival. Uh, one just has to look at what recently transpired in Guyana um, with the symposium on masquerade um, lives. Um, the, the, the impact that it is going to have on national policy um, in terms of ma masquerade being uh, formally recognized um, as a, you know, as a Christmas um, uh, season. Um, um, the, the, the mangrove project out in um, Victoria has, um, has brought into its fold as one of the cultural um, expressions of Victoria is its masquerade um, tradition. Um, Derry Atkins's uh, new composition on masquerade uh, based on the masquerade tradition has triggered a larger conversation in Guyana about composition based on Guyanese uh, idioms. Um, our publications, you know, um, you take the work of uh, the late Godfrey Chin. Um, Godfrey Chin's nostalgias emerge out of uh, him operationalizing what the Guyana Cultural Association has, um, has stood for. So to this extent, um, we will be announcing very soon the Godfrey Chin Prize for uh, Cultural um, uh, Journalism. So um, the, 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 the work of these volunteers, you know, um, Ron Lamy out there in Boston and Claire Gorin in New York and Errol Doris in Chicago and that solid but, um, group of volunteers um, in New York, um, um, that kind of volunteer work is... Um, it is doing what it's supposed to do, to preserve, to promote, and propagate our multicultural heritage. I, I, I wonder, um, no, you, you, you have, you, you, having said that, and I have sold the Ghana Cultural Association so, so beautifully, uh, how does one become a member? How does one join? Uh, that's one question. And the other question is, these DVDs of the Quequas, are they for um, are they for sale? Do, 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 are they available for first of all? Um, I I think um, that would be a nice question to direct. I think the website should give information on how that uh, is available. I know typically they are available during the family fun day um, on the Sunday after the Ghana Folk Festival. Mm -hmm. But I would encourage anyone who has a specific um, request either for a DVD or for a copy of the annual magazine to make contact with the cultural director, Claire Gorin, at 718-209-5207. Could you repeat that one more time, please? 718-209-5207. And what about the website? What is the web address? I think the website is, uh, and, and so when you're going to become increasingly uh, close to this website, I see a, a, a note has been sent to you today asking you for some professional guidance on <laughs> growing that website. I, I but I think it's www.guyanafolkfair. Um, okay, thank, thank, thank you so much. Um, when, when you mentioned preservation, preservation early on, I couldn't help but reflect on the conversation I had with Bonnie Alves, a good friend of yours, um, who was on this show and mentioned um, how important it is to, to, to chronicle and preserve uh, his historical data. And um, what, we, what we realize, or he's realizing, is that a lot of the information is not documented anywhere. Um, is there an effort on the Guyana, by the Guyana Cultural Association to remedy that? Well, um, in, 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 in ways 
within our capacity. Okay. Um, for example, um, during the masquerade symposium in Diana, mm -hmm. there was, um, for two days, we had panels featuring the elders. And all of those panels were video recorded by the Center for Communication Studies at UG and the Learning Channel. All of those um, recordings are going to be placed on a hard drive and deposited in the National Archives um, in Guyana. Wonderful. Uh, so that is one within our um, within our capacity. Um, you know, we we we've, we've you know, we, I mentioned Godfrey in print. Um, I could mention a series that um, we launched about seven years ago called Celebrating Our Creative Personalities after Billy Moore, uh, the guy who sang um, Happy Holiday, um, died um, in, you know, in, 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 in abject poverty. And had it not been for Eddie Grant, he would have been put in a, an unmarked grave. Um, we um, wrote to Fabric News saying, what could we do um, for, um, you know, for sensitizing the nation about our cultural heroes? Um, that resulted in a three-year uh, project um, of which we produced um, 50 um, researched articles um, on Guyanese musical um, icons. Um, and, and, and that that collection is considered as one of the most uh, important contributions um, to Guyana's uh, cultural history, particularly the music sector, um, so far. Um, there's a number of young scholars who are coming up now who are going to really push that um, into um, some new um, dimensions. But Guyana Cultural Association is also made up of members, and some of us individually do things. Um, I'm a professor at um, Ohio University, and my university has very um, solid relationships with the University of Guyana. And one of the things we are doing right now is mounting a training course on the assessment and preservation of audio, of analog audio materials. We are starting a process uh, which is involving Guyanese um, archivists um, and, and, and other practitioners on the systematic approach to preserving our audio heritage. Um, Guyana's audio heritage um, is under serious challenge. Um, my university and the University of Guyana with the National Archives um, is developing a strategy to deal with that. And the training program started last night and um, will continue for 15 weeks. And, and in May, um, students from Ohio University with professors from Ohio University will go to Guyana and in collaboration with teams of people from Guyana will work um, towards that aspect of um, the preservation of our heritage. So many of us um, in our individual roles um, in G many of us in GCA, in our individual roles, um, are making um, other contributions to the preservation, propagation, and promotion of Guyanese uh, heritage. And, and my, my first question, which was, uh, how does one become a member? Um, how could you. How does one become a member? How does one become a member? Yes. Just show up. Sure. <laughs> Show up, show up where Dr. Cambridge. Yeah, show up. Again, um, the, um, our uh, elections are going to be taking place um, this weekend. They are a very transparent and democratic um, organization. Uh -huh. So, Constitution requires elections every two years, and this weekend um, we will be holding those elections. And um, part of those elections are the um, election of new members. So I guess anyone who may have an interest uh, in becoming a member may want to get in touch with um, Claire Gorin at 718-209-5207 and um, signal that interest. And, um, and then the process will kick in. 
Wonderful. You know, um, I'm going to ask this question, take a break, and when we get back, I would like us to delve into it. Um, on, on your ad, the caption reads, following your passion and using it to effect social change. I would okay. really like you to touch on that before okay. we end the show. All right. Okay. Simona just posted uh, Guyana Cultural Association of New York in contact info guyfolkfest.org 718-209-5207 thanks for helping to keep the culture alive that's a great woman yes yeah, she is she yes. is an outstanding woman yes um, she ensures that the Guyana Cultural Association is transparent and accountable um, and I tip my hat Clay Patterson, an outstanding um, cultural worker. Thank you. Um, so the the question, uh, following your passion and using it to effect social change, can you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, my passion is this fundamental belief that was nurtured from working on a waterfront um, with speedy doors, um, from working in the Diana National Service in the hinterland with pioneers and pork knockers um, is that every human being has the capacity to contribute to sustainable change and the variable the factor that brings it all together is communication um, multiple forms of communication individual you know, face-to-face -face communication, small group communication, organizational communication, and what we know, mass communication and the new media. These communication assets are crucial in bringing about and sustaining social change. So, um, over, over um, the past 40 years, that is what I've been working on. Um, you know, I did my doctoral degree uh, in uh, mass communication and I looked at um, what is now very popular around the world they call it edutainment 
um, my dissertation looked at the role radio soap operas played in Jamaica's um, preparation um, for independence and its um, early post-independence life. Um, so I am a, a firm believer in uh, building the communication capacity of communities um, so that they can participate in the definition of their challenges, in identifying strategies, and in sustaining um, their gains. We call this approach participatory um, communication. Um, participatory communication is more than just dealing with a particular issue. It is about developing capacity and confidence that creates um, societies where governments um, are accountable, where their actions have to be transparent, et cetera, et cetera. To this extent, um, I am very, very happy of some work that we have, we've done with the University of Guyana, um, the Center for Communication Studies, between um, the years 2008 and, um, and, and we still continuing. Um, we have been able to um, work with the Center for Communication Study to bring um, to light, uh, to life, um, a, a, a vision that they had um, for creating a communication school that could serve um, Guyana in all of its many um, needs. Uh, we worked together with um, UG um, to develop a contemporary curriculum. Um, we worked with UG to upgrade the, uh, the, the qualifications of its uh, faculty. Um, we worked with the media professionals um, in Guyana to upgrade their skills in television, um, in documentary, and I'm so happy um, in the production of um, feature film. So, um, my passion is about communication, how it could facilitate uh, social change, and central to that is a society having the capacity um, to, 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 to create, uh, to develop um, people to work in those tasks. And, um, and you know, it, we did, I did work of that nature in uh, the Guyana National Service. I did work of that nature with the Guyana Broadcasting Corporation, and I continue to do work uh, of that nature with the um, University of Guyana. So, you know, like one of the comments um, on your Facebook page, um, I, I just hope that this conversation was not about what I did, uh, but what I am doing now right. and what I will continue to do. Mm -hmm. And I believe education and training, human resources development, particularly development of communicative and communication capacity uh, is crucial um, for uh, the creation of uh, those, the, the, the preferred society, the societies that we hope for, the societies that we aspire for. So, so, so that's what, that's how I live my passion. Um, Dr. Cambridge, being in education for so many years and such a proponent of education and communication, um, it brings me to the point of mentorship and mentoring. Um, what, what is your take on, on mentoring? Do you, do you, do you? It is crucial. Sorry? It, it, it's crucial. Uh -huh. In some places you call it advising. Right. And that's the central piece of our approach at Ohio University. But mentoring can be formal and it can be informal. Um, you know, I am the beneficiary of you know, many um, formal and informal mentors, you know. Um, so I, I'm committed to that. Um, you know, um, you know, a pat on the back, providing access to resources. Um, I'll give you an example. There's a young um, filmmaker in Guyana. Um, I think this guy has the capacity to be one of Guyana's and probably one of the Caribbean's, maybe even a, a world-class cinematographer. And um, he sent me a note last night saying, you know, I'm, I'm looking for a, a book. Uh, 
And, um, well, I thought I did not have the book. When I went online, I saw that the book now cost about 200 and odd dollars. Mm-hmm. Um, well, um, I don't have the pockets I can go and find 200 and something dollars. Um, but searching through my collection, I thought that I had the book. Now, um, what do you do? A mentor, I think, is supposed to take on some challenges, some responsibilities. Yes. Well, I think I will get that book done to him um, in, in Guyana. It is about mentoring is not about, you know, an ego trip about what I can do for people. Mm-hmm. Because in the process of mentoring, there's a reciprocity. You know, um, the mentor also is improved by the mentee. So it is recognition that you never know it all. That you have not, as my good friend Norman McLean used to say, or you, you have not arrived. You know, you've never arrived. You know, you should always recognize that there's still stuff to know. And if one could build networks among mentors and mentees, I think one is creating a virtuous circle. And I think that's a good thing. Um, Jay in the chat room asks, do you also think that a high level of emotional and spiritual wisdom and maturity are also crucial to effecting social changes? Well, clearly, um, clearly, um, you know, a higher level of consciousness, the recognition that we are here, um, with, you know, for, for another purpose that we are here, uh, you know, not as islands, um, that, that we are, that we, you know, we, that service is a transcendental thing. Um, I think all of those things are necessary. Um, you know, we may use a, a, a range of words um, to describe those concepts, um, but at the bottom of it all, um, there has to be a higher purpose um, for social change. Um, you know, change, you know, we we should recognize that you've got changes dynamic. Societies, organizations are constantly changing as they respond to variations in the environment, like 1823. 1823 was about profound social change. Mm -hmm. But then there's another type of change, social change, that we need to talk about too, that is strategic social change. You know, that when you recognize that there are inequities and, in, and injustices, um, you know, when there are children who are not going um, to bed, um, are with, you know, are going to bed with a, with a hungry bed, when there are some children who may have this ability to express themselves musically, but they do not have the opportunities or capacity. Now, those, that type of change has to be strategic. That type of change has to be organized, has to be designed, and it is responsive organizations, um, humane organizations, um, they have to play a role in doing that. So, yes, um, higher order, uh, spiritual um, consciousness, respect for ancestors, respect for traditional knowledge, all of those things are crucial in, in, in laying the foundation for sustainable social change. I agree totally with um, that question. There's a, there's a question, uh, well, Jay asks another question, but I have, I have a question for you that, that I just became present to Dr. Cambridge. But Jay's question says, as mentors come in all shapes and sizes, do you see a person who provides daily spiritual wisdom that helps to nourish or teach emotional and spiritual maturity as a mentor? Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. I, I don't have a question with that at all. I don't have a question with that. You know, that's where your ethics and that's where your moral um, are coming. That's where your caring. That's where your modeling of good citizenship. Um, you know, this is where that 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 comes from, and um, it's a crucial ingredient. The, the the question I have, and and that is based on my recent experience in Georgetown. Um, you were there around the same time. I saw uh, at first, first glance, um, I was amazed. I saw a lot of new buildings and lots of construction, large constructions, uh, unusually large for 
the for the landscape of Georgetown or what I knew it to be when I was growing up. And um, I, I am a student, not a student, but I am a proponent of modernization and, and the future. But I also respect history and historical um, uh, icons. Um, and what I noticed, and I didn't know who I can have this conversation with, but what an appropriate um, person to mention this to tonight. There seems to be an erosion of the traditional uh, Victorian style architecture. Um, I don't see much of a passion of preserving those. Uh, it seems to be a dwarfing of it, so to speak. How, first, is, do you think it is important for to to have a, lar a larger conversation about the preservation of some of these buildings, the architecture, and and um, do you think it's important? Oh, Elvin, um, Selwyn, I think it is most important because I wouldn't call some of those older buildings um, just Victorian. I would say those older buildings reflected appropriate technology. Uh -huh. So if you, you know, we went into um, Castellani House, Derry Atkins and I, on the Saturday, December the 22nd, we went to look at the, the National Art Exhibition. And it was hot outside on the road. It was hot, very hot. And when we got into Castellani House, into the exhibition space, the place was cool. You had no air conditioning. It was just all those jealousies and yes. the, the, the architecture, mm -hmm. the flow. Mm -hmm. Cesar Castellani understood the tropics and designed um, his architecture, his architectural technologies, used nature to cool the place down. So it's not Victorian. It is about appropriate and relevant technologies. Um, you know, folks of um, Rory Westmus has written a very extensive piece on jealousies and, you know, that, that technology, that, the, that architectural essence of Georgetown. What we do have now in Guyana is a transition that is taking place in the aesthetics of Georgetown as the, demo, as the demographics um, change and ostentation um, is becoming um, the, 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 you know, the, you know, that's the mantra. I could build bigger than you. And it is to me a contradiction. Because when you think about the um, energy that you're going to need to keep those concrete places cool, and you're talking about a green footprint and carbon, um, a carbon ideology and a limping, um, G, um, you know, electricity um, corporation. It is a contradiction. Yeah. So I think there is need for a larger conversation on um, the aesthetics of Georgetown. Um, as somebody pointed out to me, back in the day, you had a cake shop at each corner, right? And you know, the cake shop and the saw good shop had a social function. But today, you're putting a mall at um, at each um, corner. I think there is definitely need for a conversation, and that conversation clearly would have to speak to zoning laws and the effectiveness or the ineffectiveness of the city council. You know, um, how could you have in the middle of a street with high, you know, population people selling cooking gas? You know, um, you know. So I think Georgetown, uh, in addition to um, the, the the infrastructural. Um, weakness, weaknesses in, you know, in public health and all of that, there needs to be a conversation on that architectural um, um, de development. You know, who's going to build higher than, you know, um, when I was in Guyana the last time, I had to go and do an interview at uh, Sharma's Television about um, the Guyana Folk Festival thing. And um, just standing at that corner of there, uh, you know, of, you know, of, of you know, Rob and Wellington Street. The amount of these huge um, uh, structures going up, and then in some places they're not being finished, you know. So, um, 
it is, there is need for a conversation about that, and it should involve many of the decision makers, you know, the bankers who are funding these things, if it is the banks who are funding them, um, the city council about uh, the zoning laws, um, the architectural firms who are designing these things, um, and the infrastructure people, you know, um, do you have the capacity for the sewage? Uh, Cramped, you know, and the other is cramped. Two hundred thousand people, one third of the population living in this narrow piece. I don't know. That's that's a bigger conversation, Southern, above my pay grade. Yeah, I, I understand. The other thing that 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 affected me, um, or I, I I was exposed to, um, I I when I first got there, and of course I was glad to be home. It's home, as I said in one of my writings is where my neighbor string was buried. And um, I woke up every morning to beautiful sounds and you know, that, that really kind of helped me with my nostalgia. Um, the be beautiful sounds and of birds and different um, creatures and so on, and the, the various aromas. And, and I was enthralled with that. And then I, I went, I moved around a little bit in Georgetown and um, there was that contradiction and I, I liken it. I didn't write about this while I was there. I thought it was wise for me to get out before I, I write something like that. But one of the things that I noticed is the abundance of garbage and um, drainage seems to be a problem. And I remember in uh, early 2005, I think, when they had the, the flood and Georgetown was almost went under. And I'm wondering to know what is being done or if the, the conversation about drainage and about preserving Georgetown has um, has seized um, and to the detriment of you know the, 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 the population there that I don't understand I don't even know how to phrase such a question to you but I'm, I'm concerned about it because I have people who relatives who still live there um, what what was your, some of your concerns about about that the, the garbage the drainage that kind of stuff well, hey, before before I come to, to the, the, the garbage and drainage thing, um, you mentioned about uh, the, the 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 inspiration that you derive from hearing the sound of nature. Um, I I I consistently derive that uh, that pleasure, and I'm constantly asking the question: Why are Guyanese musicians uh, composing? Um, music uh, that celebrate the songs of our songbirds, uh, but that's uh, that's another question. Um, uh, in terms of the infrastructure, you know, I have I had a great friend. Um, he's now dead, Dr. Roy Ibert, and um, during the um, late seventies and early eighties. We shared an apartment on Fulton Court on um, Blasingen Road. And um, at that time, the styrofoam packaging and plastic bag packaging um, was coming in to Guyana 20 years ago. And it was predicted that where we are in Guyana now um, was a destination. Um, because A, um, we have a problem with, um, you know, with the discipline. There's a discipline problem, you know. Um, littering is par for the course. So when you litter with, with materials that are not degradable, biodegradable, you're going to run into the problem. You, I read a newspaper article about the high water that's coming over the sea walls now. And what is it bringing over onto the, um, the road? It is bringing over the styrofoam boxes and the plastic bags um, from uh, that's littering um, behind the sea wall. So it's a, it's a discipline issue too. I think communication has to, communication engineering and enforcement uh, has to be introduced to deal with the problem. It is not only the government uh, they may have to do the engineering and enforcement, but 
us as the citizens, we need to do some education about how we litter, how we not um, litter. You know, when I was in Ghana last time, I went to buy something, and the person asked me, you want a black bag? And, you know, it was that ubiquitous black plastic bag. So, um, you know, I put it in my suitcase, and when I came home, um, and I was unpacking the bag, you know, taking out the goodies. My wife said to me, why, you know, what is this garbage bag? We know what you do with this garbage bag. You know, here in the United States, black plastic is associated with garbage. Right. In Guyana, black plastic is not associated with garbage. I think we need to work on multiple symbolic meanings and stuff within our society. So that garbage problem, that littering problem, is a complex problem. Um, government got to do engineering and enforcement, but we as citizens, we have to do some work on educating ourselves about the consequences of littering. Dr. Cambridge, time, time, time is upon us uh, when a conversation is going so well and so sweet. Um, time usually takes a back seat. I just want to read a few uh, comments. Uh, Jay says, uh, no, Sharon, Sharon Jones says, do you see the generation gap hampers effective mentoring, um, hampering effective mentoring? There, there was the generation X, now there are the generation Yers. Can, how can we merge that gap? And then Esther says, uh, excellent question, Selwyn. I happen to live in one of those Victorian style homes, grew up there, and I am striving to preserve the architectural style, but it isn't easy. Um, and then as to say, I agree with Dr. Cambridge, the people need to be educated about littering and its effects. Attitudes have to change. Very interesting program, thank you both. Dr. Cambridge, um, I just want to say something quickly when you mentioned the, about the, the, um, the musicians uh, taking cues from the songs of nature. I remember having a conversation many years ago with the late um, the Donna Locke, the, the artist, and um, he was commenting on my use of colors. And in, he, he said to me, uh, well, you know, I, he was one of my mentors and he said to me, the colors that you use are so rich and, 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 and diverse and beautiful. But, and, and I believe they come from, you're influenced by the things you see when you wake up in the morning and you move around as a child. And uh, that stuck with me. Um, I didn't realize that you know, our environment, or how much our environment impact our creativity. But that said, I would like to ask you, which I ask most of my guests, to give us some words of wisdom on your way out and um well so then to give words of wisdom would be a presumption you know i don't have any um words of wisdom but um i would just say that um the late laurie lewis used to say to me in the absence if you understand what the mission is in the absence of instructions do your best so if we all know that there are some things to be done for our country and there are no organizations yet in place to do that, just let us do it without expectations of a reward, but just knowing that what we do could be a benefit to the next generation. Do what you have to do without expecting rewards. Thank you very much. Thank you. Step beyond yourself. I read somewhere where they said uh, it was it said it says um to do something that is bigger than yourself without expectation is one of the greatest contribution you could make to humanity i Absolutely. want to thank you very much dr cambridge it has been a very informative and enlightening and inspiring conversation and so good night and this is selma collins of cws signing off thank you so and same to you you're welcome Frustration